morning and welcome to our latest edition of Office Hours. My name is John Kowalski. I'm part of the marketing team here at Bit Gardner, and I'd like to welcome you. Um, today we're talking protective coatings. Um, it's really more of an introduction to uh, protective coatings, fundamentals um, of the protective coatings and of inspection equipment. Um, we also have later this month uh, on the 22nd, a full-blown presentation around protective coatings where we'll go into things a little deeper. Um, if you're interested in registering for that, there's a link I put in the chat box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. So you can just copy and paste that URL and that'll take you right to the registration page. Uh, also, if you're unfamiliar with our office hours format, uh, it's usually a shortened presentation, 20, 25 minutes, followed by your questions and discussion. So if you have questions, if something's on your mind, if you're experiencing a challenge uh, within your own facility, uh, please log something in the chat box immediately following the presentation, we'll get to it. Also, we are recording this and immediately following, you'll receive an automated marketing email, which will contain the link. Feel free to watch at a later uh, date, share it with colleagues, whatever you like. Um, some people have even used it for date night. So. I, I wouldn't advise that, but hey, w whatever to you. <laughs> so with that, uh, let me introduce our speaker. He is our business line manager for protective coatings, uh, Mr. Matt Fight. Matt, it's all yours, sir. Hey, thanks, Sean. I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, my name is Matt Fight. I'm the PTE PC uh, business line manager. Uh, basically, uh, you know, we, we work with both Bit Gardner USA and Paul Gardner Company, uh, kind of offer the complete gamut, you know, from color and appearance to physical testing um, equipment. Uh, yeah, so this short 20, 25 minute presentation, like John said, is going to be an overview of, you know, what is steel, uh, what is the process of corrosion, uh, you know, a little talking about QA and QC roles within the um, inspection world of coatings. And, you know, we're just going to touch real briefly on uh, ambient conditions, some of the gauges used in ambient conditions, um, and kind of kind of hop into it. Uh, like John said, for the upcoming um, uh, full, full Monty, as we'll call it, we're going to go through the whole gamut from ambient conditions to profile, to dry film, to holiday testing, to hardness testing, uh, adhesion testing, and get, get really in depth with uh, formulation of carbon steel, weathering steel, uh, some precious metals and how they're used in the um, uh, protection world. Um, so with that, we'll get right into it. And uh, you know, like John said, if you have any questions, please post them in the chat. Uh, if it's something we can answer online, we shall do that. If it is a one-off situation, um, you know, just drop your contact information and uh, we'll take care of it. All right. All right, so uh, modern coatings are basically used for two key functions, appearance and protection of whatever substrate uh, can corrode. Color and appearance, color and gloss, you know, that's the appealing portion of a coating system. But, you know, the, the real function of a coating system is protect the substrate. Uh, coatings are expected and designed uh, to perform in a variety of elements on many substrates like steel, concrete, wood, plaster, uh, etc. You know, coating manufacturers spend a lot of a lot of time, effort, and money developing new systems all the time and, you know, always trying to come up with a, a better coating system, longer life, easier application, um, et cetera. So for this presentation, you know, we'll just talk about the most commonly protected substrate in an industrial or marine application. That's going to be hot rolled carbon steel. Carbon steel, you know, it's used to hold up buildings, bridges, hospitals, uh, athletic stadiums, schools, you know, water storage tanks or fuel storage tanks, uh, dams, etc. And, you know, corrosion is the most persistent and natural threat to any steel structure. So uh, the process of making steel 
uh, you know, you're turning the iron ore into carbon steel, employing extremely high temps and a huge amount of energy. If you look at it that way, it's, it's kind of interesting that the reversal of this process, which is what corrosion is, it's very spontaneous and requires little more than, you know, the electrolyte, an anode, cathode, or the pathway. Um, you know, while the creation of steel requires energy of heat, corrosion only requires exposure to the right conditions. So many products and processes can be used to uh, slow down the uh, process of corrosion, um, but specifically using industrial coatings, uh, that is the primary barrier for protection. Industrial coatings protect the steel by isolating the substrate from a service environment. That is the idea behind barrier protection. Uh, you can also uh, come up with products that you add rust inhibitors to. That's going to add be classified as inhibitive protection. Or by incorporating metal, typically zinc, uh, that will sacrifice itself or corrode first to protect the steel surface. Uh, this is labeled sacrificial or galvanic protection. You know, in a lot of these situations, you know, we could also get into talking about the use of coatings and cathodic protection. Uh, but that is a topic for another day that we will be doing in the future. Industrial coatings do have a long history uh, when talking about co corrosion protection. Uh, as, I, as I stated a few slides ago, that history is ever evolving. Uh, you know, the major coating manufacturers and uh, a lot of the niche type coating manufacturers are consistently working on new products uh, to extend uh, substrate life, coating system life, and it's a, it's a very, very uh, great industry to be in. I've been in it my whole adult life, so I'm kind of jaded, but it is what it is. So there's not a single coating or system that can be expected to provide corrosion protection uh, forever uh, because there are so many different service environments. And you know, if you look at it in this way, a coating system has a beginning, a middle, and an end. The life cycle of a coating system, you know, should be monitored for performance and degradation. You know, that's going to help you anticipate the useful end of a coating system. It's going to help you line up your scheduled maintenance. Uh, can you touch up work, overcoat, or is it going to require you at some point in time to remove the coating system and start all over? For example, if a system has been designed and tested for a specific environment, you know, the inspected life may have a 15 to 20 year um, expected life, uh, you know, provided that it is ad adequately maintained. And if that system is applied and begins to fail during the first or second year, that is what we call premature failure. All right, so this is just a brief chart. We will get into this more in the, uh, in the next uh, presentation. This is just a chart uh, from all the industry research that shows why does a coding system fail prematurely? Um, don't wanna to get too far into the weeds, but if you look here, this big blue portion, uh, a large overwhelming uh, majority of failures are caused by poor surface preparation, uh, could be, you know, contamination left on a substrate, could be poor profile, could be using the wrong profile. You know, you, somebody specified shot when they should have specified angler or grit. Um, so 73-ish percent of all coating failures revolve around the preparation aspect. All right. So a good coating project, it's going to be dependent on many elements uh, coming together at the same time. Um, and, you know, we'll just go through these quickly. You know, proper specification for the service environment. You know, you're not going to, as silly as it seems, you're not going to recommend house paint for a bridge span. Uh, you know, you always have to monitor atmospheric conditions. That's what we'll talk about in this um, presentation. Appropriate prep and application equipment. Make sure your application equipment is, is, is running properly. There's no water or oil in the airlines, your blaster, et cetera, et cetera. Very important, you know, skill and well-trained laborers. 
you know, it doesn't matter if you're if you're a, a blaster or a coding applicator. You know, there's there's great training programs uh, out there in the industry. Um, you know, not only through AMP, AMPP, which was formerly NACE and SSPC, but there's a lot of a lot of local organizations that offer you know skilled training. So well-defined and executed quality control and quality assurance programs. Uh, you know, we'll get more into specification writing, pre-job meetings, uh, what to look for, what to ask, uh, you know, pre-job questions, et cetera, in the next presentation. Well-trained and ethical codings inspectors. Uh, I myself am a NACE CIP level two coding inspector. Uh, that was more for my educational training um, than actually hanging off a bridge deck at any point in my career, but still, you know, they do talk in these training programs a lot about the ethics behind being an inspector. You know, do you pass a project? Do you fail a project? You know, what is right? What is wrong? And then properly maintain coding system um, appropriate, coding system which is appropriate for the environment and calibrated inspection equipment. I don't want to, <laughs> I could spend a few days talking about the requirements of calibration, uh, the importance of calibration and keeping your equipment up to date. Uh, if you have any sort of a QC or QA role in your organization, or if you're an independent uh, inspector or applicator, you, you know specifically what I'm talking about. All right, so these are the learning outcomes that we hope to uh, obtain or hope to provide to, to you all uh, during the next presentation. And you can see we get we get pretty in depth. I mean, it's, it's certainly not a, you know, a week long training class, but you know, we want to make sure you have the basic fundamentals to, to at least ask the right questions if you're if you're on a job site or if your organization uh, does this in shop painting, um, or if you you know you, you listen to our presentation here and you say, hey, uh, I'm very interested in, in going ahead and continuing my education and I want to get some uh, certifications. All right. So what is corrosion and what are the roles of high performance coatings? So NACE defines corrosion, like I said, now AMP. Uh, it's as a deterioration of a substrate, usually metal, or its properties because of a reaction with the environment. Corrosion is a natural process. It's a propensity or tendency of the materials to give up energy and return to their natural state. We discussed earlier that it takes a tremendous amount of energy to convert the materials found in nature, iron ore, into usable materials for construction like carbon steel. Uh, but it will release that energy and convert back to its original state unless protected fairly quickly. You know, I think we've all seen bridges or tanks that we've driven by or looked at. And, you know, if it's if the coating system isn't applied properly, you can see corrosion really, really quickly. All right, so protective coatings are the most widely used method to prevent corrosion. Uh, coatings provide thousands, you know, protect thousands of structures, including offshore rigs, uh, ships, you know, we're talking marine, storage tanks, power plants, uh, shipping containers, pipelines, railway, and uh, obviously bridges. Industrial coatings, you know, they've been around since the 1930s, but the importance really kicked off uh, during the World War II period. Um, you know, there was a development of polyamide epoxies. They offered better adhesion to poorly prepared substrates, you know, some flexibility uh, and increased resistance to water. You know, back then, uh, they really didn't care about the appearance side of things as long as the, uh, you know, performance was there. All right, so what is steel? You know, let's consider the corrosion of common carbon steel. And, you know, we'll look at iron since that's the most component, um, primary component of the steel that corrodes. Steel is composed of iron at concentrations of 95 to 99% by weight. And the difference of ordinary steel and pure iron is the addition of carbon, uh, typically up to 2% and other elements uh, the carbon uh, addition increases the steel and adds other desirable properties to the metal. 
A variety of steel alloys can be provided, produced by adding elements such as copper, chromium, nickel, or phosphorus. And you know, these additions can produce a significant reduction in the corrosion rate of steel alloys, but as you all know, they cost a lot more uh, than basic, basic carbon steel. All right, so how do coatings protect the substrate for corrosion? So the corrosion process occurs in metals. It cannot be completely stopped. I mean, a lot of coating manufacturers claim, you know, complete barrier protection, um, but corrosion, moisture, whatever, does find a way through the best of coating systems. Uh, you know, sometimes there's damage that occurs, you know, backfilling a pipeline, um, you know, it's gonna mess up that fusion bond of the epoxy on the, on the uh, pipe. You know, that's why cathodic protection is used in, in side by side with that but all right so you know the act of slowing down the process is the best way or the best option to preserve the metal we talked a little bit about this earlier but coatings function as protective layer in three different ways Bar barrier coating sacrificial coatings or inhibitive coatings so we'll just briefly talk about uh, barrier protection uh, it's the simplest way a coating system functions as a protective layer. It refers to the physical barrier that is formed on the substrate by any coating. This presents air and water, which are necessary for corrosion from reaching the substrate if applied properly and inspected. All coatings provide barrier protection, but some coatings have characteristics that enhance the barrier function of the coating. Uh, so, you know, you, you can talk about MEO or aluminum flake coating systems. If you look at the, at the uh, chart here, you know, they form a plate-like layer in a coating film. So it makes it more difficult for water and air to penetrate the plates of the flake coatings. So it takes a lot longer for them to read, reach the substrate. Now we'll touch briefly on the process of coating inspection, what, what the different roles are and uh, you know, how we can look at this um, you know, from uh, the owner of a um, substrate or the owner of a project uh, to the contractor to the uh, third party that may be working for the owner. So quality is defined as the characteristics of a product or service that bear on its ability to satisfy stated or implied needs typically required by the specification. Uh, it may be to the degree with a product or service is free of nonconformities <laughs> and may be the extent of satisfying the specification requirements. You know, that's why you have specification ranges. It's, you know, in a perfect world, it would always be perfect, but, you know, there, there does have to be uh, leeway, as we'll call it, written into specifications. Quality control. So quality control is a contractor's responsibility. Um, it involves performing the proper observation, uh, inspection test, and documentation. Documentation is real big in today's day and age to verify that the work is performed, meets or exceeds minimum quality standards established by the owner through the project specification or you know, other industry standards. QC verification that the contractor's activity activities get the job done right. Quality assurance. Uh, this is generally performed by the owner or a third party uh, inspection firm on behalf of the owner. QA verifies that the quality work performed by the contractor is what was reported by quality control. So quality control being the contractor uh, does their work, does the inspection and provides a document to the quality assurance inspector and the QA inspector basically does their own work as well. So the QA provides confidence that the requirements of the spec were met. QA by the owner is meant to verify that the QC implemented by the contractor meets a specification. I know we said that a few times, but it is very important. So what is the role of a coding inspector? inspector? The role is to observe, assess, document, and report, OADR. Observe the work performed by the contractor, assess whether the performed work meets the requirements of the spec, you document the results of your inspection and whether or not it meets a spec. Then you report the predetermined frequency that the progress and quality in relation to the specification. OADR. 
All right, so we're going to talk real briefly about surface prep, ambient conditions, and you know, kind of kind of move along here. So, what is the purpose of preparation? You know, it's twofold. You're going to clean the substrate, and you're going to roughen the surface. Speaking of of steel, to accept the coating system. And so, the preparation of a steel substrate prior to coating application, you know, it's it's widely recognized as the most critical step during an industrial coatings project. And, you know, you see a few different uh, pictures in a slide here. It looks like we have somebody power washing, trying to get some soluble salts off the substrate prior to blasting. You know, the middle picture there looks like a, a VIS standard, trying to see if the blast meets the specification, whether it's SP10, SP5 at the bottom there. And then the right picture there is a close-up picture of angular grit. And the final prep of the surface will ultimately determine the surface life of the coating system. So what, what are we looking at during surface preparation? You know, obviously we, we're going to talk about some equipment used to measure ambient conditions, uh, but you're going to measure your conditions, you know, check the cleanliness, you know, the surface. It's not just using the visual standard. There's numerous, numerous methods, you know, you're going to check for there's a lot of a lot of tests that you can do to check for soluble salts prior to um, abrasive blasting. Uh, you know, dust, dust. You check for dust. You can use a white cloth, uh, or they make some fancy dust kits nowadays. And then you're going to check the profile. You know, I think we all know what replica tape is, or you know, a digital depth micrometer. We'll get get more into that in the next presentation. All right, conditions, ambient conditions are the prevailing conditions of air temperature, moisture content of the air, expressed as relative humidity, or you'll typically see it as RH, and the temperature at which condensation will occur, expressed as the dew point temperature. Uh, paint specs of all types, you know, definitely going to have requirements for monitoring ambient conditions and surface temp and contain specific thresholds for air and surface temp and relative humidity. So typically, you know, a specifier, a coating specifier architect is going to work with the coating manufacturer. Uh, if you pull out a pan, uh, a can of paint, you look at the side of it, every single can of paint that I've ever seen or sold or, you know, applied myself, there's a recommended application range on the side of that can. Yeah, you know, we could be talking about, a, you know, an industrial epoxy or regular house paint. All right, so measuring and recording conditions in surface temp prior to final surface prep and coating application, it's one of the most important steps in determining the success of a, of a coating system. So yeah, you know, obviously we're gonna really pay attention to the conditions prior to surface prep because you don't want them to be out of range and then you blast your, blast your surface, you come back 10 minutes later and there's a lot of flash rusting going on or, or something like that. You know, really, really upsets the uh, blaster when that occurs in the project manager. Uh, but don't forget about, you know, the coating application. You know, that's, it's a real thing. That's why they make all these fancy pieces of equipment. That's why they make paint thermometers to keep in the, uh, in the painting. That's why you, you have to follow your induction times recommended by the coating manufacturers. It's all part of the, part of the plan here. And, uh, you know, like I said, applying the coating system outside of the manufacturer's specs, you know, that could result in premature coating failure. Everything else in the process may pass. You may hit your dry film thickness, you may pass your holiday test, and you may pass your adhesion, but there's stuff that goes on underneath the, subs the surface that, that could cause premature failure. Uh, as we stated earlier, there's three conditions that are most commonly uh, measured on a painting project air temp, relative humidity, and the dew point. So the surface temp is also measured and recorded, then compared to the dew point temp to verify the moisture in the air will not condense on the surface. If anybody can tell me what that variant should be, you get bonus points and a free BIC gift that we will uh, mail out to you. All right, so here, here's just a few pieces of equipment. You know, believe it or not, the old sling psychrometer and psychometric data tables are still uh, widely, widely used, um, you know, in our industry today. It's still taught in class. Uh, you know, you got your wet bulb, you got your dry bulb, you whirl it around. 
uh, in the air uh, for increments of 30 seconds or so until you get a stabilized reading. And then you pull out your old psychometric charts here. Uh, locate the barometric pressure that you're working in and you get your readings that way. On the right here, we have a, a really nice you know, digital hygrometer, typically called a dew point meter. Uh, you know, whatever the brand is, this is a DeFalsco model, Elcometer, uh, TQC, whoever it may be, they all have very nice units that uh, once these units stabilize to the work environment, meaning you can't just hop out of your vehicle, run up to a bridge and, and take your readings. You know, air conditioned to a, you know, 80 degree day, these things don't work that well. You have to let it stabilize. But look, it has everything right there for you. You know, it, you, can, you can save these readings, you can Bluetooth them to your cell phone for reporting purposes, et cetera. Well, once again, we'll get more into that in the next presentation. Okay, like I said, sling psychrometers, electric psychrometers, or digital hygrometers as they're called. Magnetic dial temp, surface temp gauges. You know, a lot of these are still very commonly used. Rail car, you know, you'll see a lot of the four, four back magnets for the uh, rail car. You know, as those guys are, are blowing and going, as they say, just stick it on a substrate, and that's an uh, analog version of your surface temp. You know, you got the, the fancy uh, IR guns here in the middle. That can take your temperatures instantly. Make sure you, you're using them from the right distance. And then this little guy here, what's well, actually not too little, but this guy here on the right hand side, uh, it's going to be like an oven temp recorder. You know, uh, or if you're working in a shop application, you can you can smack this uh, sensor here on the right onto the wall of your booth, and then it it you know automatically is going to record your your temperature conditions and uh, allow you to download for, for data. And actually, you know, depending on your operation, you may have a, be running multiple shifts. You know, this can, this can give the project manager or coding supervisor, they can come in and see if something went wrong or something went out of spec in the booth. Uh, it records that digitally so you can go back and check and see if there was a problem with your coding system. All right, I think that's in depth enough. John's probably shaking his head right now, telling me to shut up. But uh, <laughs> no. No, it's all good, all good stuff. Um, all right, you know, a lot, a lot so of there we go. Yeah, yeah a lot that's of new good, stuff man. for me, and uh, yeah, always learning. Got to do that. Uh, so, yeah, man. folks out there, questions? Uh, please log any questions, comments in in the chat box in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Uh, we'll get to them. Um, you know, one thing, Matt, that stood out to me was that, was that chart you put up. 73% uh, was due, failures was due to poor surface preparation. Why is that number that high? Is it just lack of education? Are people taking shortcuts and not following, you know, the right procedures or the right, you know, making sure the ambient temperatures and, and conditions are are right. What's, what's your take on that? So the simple answer is a little bit of everything. Um, yeah. It does take a lot to put together a good quality specification. It does take a lot to educate and train your staff. And quite honestly, it does take a lot to follow all the steps that you need to do. Um, you know, people think that you just walk up you know, you see a surface, maybe power wash it, let it dry off, and then paint it. Yeah. Uh, it's not always the case. I mean, you know, depending on the surface prep that was specified, you know, abrasive blasting, there's three or four steps that, that, that could happen before you even, you know, even touch that, that abrasive blaster. Uh, depending on your service environment, you know, part of the country that you're in, are you, are you working in the marine environment where, where the salt is very prevalent? Are you working out in a uh, rural area in farm country where you know you have to worry about other types of salts like nitrates. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot that goes into it, and a lot of times it's not even that people don't want to do it correctly. A lot of times, you, you know, you, you kind of get a bad specification. You get an old spec. A lot of times they'll, mm -hmm. they'll copy and paste, you know, from one project to the next, and it doesn't always meet meet the needs. Mm -hmm. That's why I talked briefly about the importance of a job job discussion, you know, pre job meeting. Uh, yeah. A lot of stuff gets uncovered prior to the job, and it should. Um, but yeah, I mean, 
prep is such a it's such a touchy subject. Um, it, it takes a lot of effort to do it properly, but it is the most important, in my opinion, process. Of yeah. Prepping. It sounds like it because there's just so many variables. It's, you know, number one, what are you putting the coating on? You know, what's the substrate? You know, what is the environment? You mentioned, you know, something in the Midwest, some rural setting versus something on the coast. Um, yeah, just a lot of, lot of variables. And if it's not done right, and it, you know, you hit on it, you know, someone taking up an old spec. Well, more than likely things have changed in the last 20 years of, you know, where you're, you know, putting the coating on, how you're preparing the surface, all of those things. Um, yeah, yeah I mean, you would laugh. I, yeah, I used to do a little bit of a uh, little bit of review of specifications and you'd have people writing uh, coal tar epoxies into specs less than five years ago. I mean, coal tar epoxies have been illegal for a long time. <laughs> you know, it's just wow. with, the, with the VOC regulations, you know, coding systems have changed yeah. over, over many years. And a lot of the people, a lot of the I'll quote, say, old timers, you know, so, ah, that was good stuff. You could put that stuff over anything. <laughs> yeah, because there's a lot more dangerous stuff in it as well. Yeah, exactly. When you just exactly. got to, you got to roll with the times and, you know, yeah. uh, painting projects aren't simple. Some of them are, but for the most mm -hmm. part, you know, it, it takes a lot of, a lot of attention, a lot of work to make it work properly. Mm -hmm. And then, and it's going to last. You're not, not going to find it failing, you know, after a couple of years. That's the name of the game. Yeah, you know, and that's you know that's a good a good spec written for the right environment. You know, you you can see, you can look at reports, and you know we used to have access to certain reports. Look at projects we're thirty years old, and minus some dust and dirt, they're tightly mm -hmm. adhering, and uh, you know, no rust showing. And you can look nice. at stuff done within a year or two and see, you know edge edge rust edge edge retention rust and you know just it's a different you know different approach to looking at things i guess yeah i uh, got a question in here from sam uh for okay. powder painting uh do we need to control the temperature in the painting booths uh so that we don't get rusting what are your thoughts there so I mean, if you're talking about a booth application, I would imagine that there's going to be some sort of uh, temperature control, uh, humidity control, and, you know, powder coatings do uh, have, you know, specific recommendations for application ranges on them. Um, I, I don't know how in-depth you would have to be. It's going to depend on what, you know, what you're painting. Are you, you, you painting uh, uh, girders or you painting little widgets, but you know, for, for the most part, I would say it's, it's a good practice to control your conditions. Yeah. You know, I'm not, not saying you go through the process of uh, dehumidification or anything like that, but yeah. just read the spec, read the coding, yeah. read the he, coding he, product. He, he, he just added steel frames for lawnmowers. Oh yeah. Yeah. So we're talking powder coatings, not electrostatic applications. If, I, if I'm trying yeah. to understand it correctly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, then I, I, I would definitely say that because, I mean, you're going through the process of, you know, preparing a surface, you're probably blasting the steel, putting whatever profile to it. You know, you, you don't want to let conditions mess up your, your coating system. So I would definitely monitor it. Mm -hmm. And depending on the part of the country or wherever part of the world that you're in, it may not be an issue. You know, there's, there's parts of the world that have generally low uh, relative humidity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dry, arid conditions are always... Uh, Nice. <laughs> yes, yes. Good, Sam. Glad that helped. Thank you. Um, other questions? Log them in here. We have lots of time left here. Um, another thing that stood out to me, Matt, that you mentioned was um, calibration. I, you know, I don't know much about that, but should you be calibrating your instruments or devices every time you go out there? Or is it annually? Is it, you know, what do you recommend? Yeah, yeah, okay. So that that's a great question, and it's calibration very... versus certification, also. Right. Um, so there's there's two ways to look at this, and I'll, I'll get the first one out of the way. So sure. the manufacturer of the product or an authorized 
dealer or representative, meaning a, you know, a third party calibration lab, are fully capable of offering calibrations on equipment. You know, there's a bunch of them out there. We don't have to get into the names, but yeah. there's a main difference. Everything that gets put through a traceable process, uh, whether it's, you know, a NIST traceable document, an ISO 17025 process, you know, you're, you're putting it through the steps, you're referencing your gauge, whatever that piece of equipment is, versus a known um, standard. So that is calibration. Okay, there's there's no other way to talk about it. Calibration is performed by the manufacturer or an authorized representative. Okay. What you want to do, you talked about, you know, windows of calibration. So, you know, they're really there. <laughs> I mean, some organizations like Sunoco and BP, uh, they actually recommend that their equipment for inspection is done every six months. At least that's what it used to be. I don't know if that's the case. I haven't spoken to some of those guys in a while. Sure. But a typical calibration window is going to be 12 months. That could vary. You know, well, hey, I only use my gauge, you know, every so often. So maybe 24 months is okay for you. Here's the, here's the, the tricky part. Verification of accuracy, okay? It's even kind of taught improperly in training classes every once in a while. You know, if you're not calibrating your gauge in the field. You're verifying its accuracy. You can do that with... You know, for dry foam gauges, you can use that with coating thickness standards. You know, some some guys will will check their you know digital hygrometers or dew point meters with a calibrated sling psychrometer. You know, you you have two bulbs, you can put your digital hygrometer right next to it and say, yeah, yeah, it's within range or it's plus or minus whatever that's acceptable. So that's what I want to you know we'll we'll talk about this more in depth in the next. Um, you know, presentation, but calibration is done by the manufacturer or a representative, but you should verify the accuracy of your gauges uh, prior to every shift. Um, that's, you know, that's what we taught. That's what, you know, if, if, if you have, uh, you know, a certain QP certification, you know, QP1, QP3 for shop painting, you know, those, those guys have records. They have to prove that their equipment is in calibration. And uh, it's, it's usually done before every shift. It's just good good practice is, is what we say. Yeah, and you, you have that paper trail too, because if your equipment's within that verification uh, or within that uh, standard it's supposed to be, then, I mean, if you get a failure, I mean, you get into lawsuits and all that stuff, but if you have the data to back up that you did things properly, that the equipment was properly, you know, certified, you know, you know, properly calibrated, then, you know, that helps your case a whole lot because it could be a, a failure in the coding, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of people want to point at the coding manufacturers and, you know, they've been in paints and coatings or, equipment calibration for over 20 years i i can honestly count on my hands the amount of times i've actually seen a coding failure um, okay there's usually underlying factors to that i mean coding manufacturers go to great lengths to make sure their products are good um but yeah that is a paper trail like you said there's a daily inspection report you know that, that gets filled out whether you're qc or qa and you say okay i verified my gauge seemed to be working properly Okay. I have the calibration documents here. I'm in calibration per whoever. Um, it's just, you know, it kind of gives you a reassurance. That's what it is. It's a reassurance that the equipment you're using is functioning as it should. That's the whole gist between keeping your equipment in good working order. Yeah. And it, and it goes back to that, that chart, 73% of failures is due yep. to poor surface preparation. So yeah, you know, maybe, maybe we need to do a whole separate webinar on just surface prep and to get that number down as a whole because it, it's just it seems a little ridiculous. Yeah, maybe, yeah. To me, anyway, I'm a marketing guy, so you know. Well, no, you're <laughs> right. It is. It is, and that you know that's a that's a percentage. I mean, it doesn't tell you how many you know system sure. failures there are, but uh, you know, I'm sure there's enough to be honest it's, with you. <laughs> it's yeah, it's more than directional there. Um, yeah. Another question here. Uh, what was that tool used to measure moisture levels? We are looking to control temperature in an overseas container. 
We use VCI packaging, but have issues controlling rust on poorly finished parts because of high humidity in the containers. We also right. use uh, the seconds, D-E-S-I-C-C-A-N-T-S in the container. Desiccant. 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 Thank mm-hmm. you. That's a new word for me. In the containers <laughs> and the VCI packaging, yep. uh, but need more al- need more information on the gauges uh, that, you know, Vic recommends to test this. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the VCI paper is typically called Viz paper. Okay. Um, just for example, it, it looks like brown wrapping paper, but it has a certain inhibitor on it to, uh, to keep, you know, moisture out. Um, in a previous life, we did a lot of blasting of steel panels and sent them off to coating manufacturers and we would wrap everything in Viz paper. So by the time it gets to wherever, you know, you don't have flash rusting like they're talking about here. It's, it's not, it's not a be all end all. It's not going to completely destroy the product, but it is annoying when you, you get something you know shipped to you and you open it up and there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of rust on it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you, if you look, if you look at the screen, you know, it could be something as in depth. There's a lot of different, you know, this is probably more high end for what you need. Uh, but there are a lot of products, um, you know, that will record uh, temperature, humidity, everything um, for long periods of time. Dixon, uh, D-I-C-K-S-O-N, uh, makes, makes a wide variety of uh, equipment made just for measuring ambient conditions, uh, data recorders. I know DeFelsco has, has a few, few good uh, gauges that you can just toss in there and automatically download all the data to your cell phone via uh, Bluetooth or, or whatever. But yeah. yeah, there's a lot of, you know, we can send that. I don't know who said the question, but we can send, get their information yeah. and we can send them a bunch of different gauges. Yeah. I mean, you can monitor it. Unfortunately, you can't do anything about it when it's coming over. <laughs> you know, you, you could see what the uh, conditions mm-hmm. are, but that doesn't help you uh, remediate the uh, situation, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so Sam, we'll, we'll take your information. We'll, we'll connect you with Matt after the fact here. And, uh, you know, you can talk with him about, uh, you know, what would work best for you in, in your situation. So thank Thanks for reaching out. Appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see what, you know, when it comes to, um, I guess I keep coming back to surface prep, but I, I mean, there's probably a lot of people out there that don't even think about surface prep. They just, you know, spray the coating on and, and go. If someone's just at that basic level, but they want to increase or enhance their sophistication of, of their operation, you know, what are the key elements or what directions, you know, would you guide them towards, you know, first do this, second do this, third do this. Is, is there a, a a set, um, I guess, order of things, someone just getting into this, uh, you know, a set order or, or process? Yeah, yeah, and that's, you know what, for me, since I've been around the industry for so long, it's a pretty easy answer. Um, there's a lot of great organizations. Um, I, I think I think overseas is, uh, Frozio is a, is a good organization, AMP, AMPP, which is now, as I've said, the combination of NACE and SSPC. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, we, we deal with the uh, IUPATs, the International Painters Union. Um, if you're just getting off the ground, you know, there's a lot of programs that aren't real expensive, to be honest with you. Uh, they, they can give you checklists. They can give you procedures. Um, there's many, many years of, uh, you know, training and education. And, you know, I did it this way. Uh, this mm-hmm. worked, this didn't work. Uh, you know, a lot of these organizations that you can get involved in, it's, you're basically, it's volunteer work and you, you want yeah. the industry to succeed. So I would go to a large organization like an AMP or a Frozio or, you know, local painters union. And I would ask them like, Hey, this, you know, this is what I do. This is what I want to get into. You know, can you help me? And they'll help you with everything, you know, from product recommendations, meaning application equipment, blasting equipment, um, checklists to follow every day. There's really a lot of help out there to inexpensive. You know, I recommend doing it just because, you know, you could have, you could even have a coding or painting background, 
but um, it always helps to follow uh, procedures. No, oh, that's great. That's great too. And if, if anyone out there has any, any questions for us, for Matt specifically, we have a, uh, an inside and a field sales team um, that, that are all trained and willing to help. Um, if you think of something after the fact, just hit reply to any of the marketing emails you get. We'll um, route it to the appropriate people and they'll get back with you, you know, within a day or so and uh, be able to help you out with any, any challenges you may have. Um, what else? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to touch base on that, John, it's, you know, obviously we have the equipment. We like to sell the equipment, but, you know, I, I find myself just talking to a lot of people. You know, yeah. like you just talk and I'm always interested to hear about applications or, or challenges. And right. sometimes there's easy solutions. Sometimes there isn't. Sometimes yeah. you can get, you know, I've stumbled on many a project where uh, different applications were developed, you know, coding oh. systems were developed. And it's, it's pretty cool because like I said, it's multi, multi-billion dollar industry, but it's still a small industry. Oh. Um relatively speaking so you get a lot of help you get a lot of buy-in so yeah yeah and if if there's something that you have a challenge that you have that we haven't run across we'd be more than happy to do some testing do some trials with you to find the right solution to, to make make your lives easier um you know we're, we're all about learning too and, and sharing what we know uh, with you so um, yeah i mean that's a good point john i mean we don't you know we're we're equipment manufacturers it's you know we we don't we love to see new stuff or run across new projects we don't charge anything for it you know yep. we we think we have an application for you we'll, we'll do it side by side and yep. you know we have a lot of rsms across the country that are very well trained with equipment and we can come to you you know if you got proprietary information we can sign an nda and come on out yeah. you know, whatever yep. the case may be dude exactly all exactly, exactly. So I think we got a few minutes left. If anybody has any questions uh, here, um, Matt, when, when you're talking to customers and, and, and solving these problems with them, um, I, do you see frequently asked questions or do you get frequent situations that um, you know occur more times than not? You know what, a lot of the stuff that we get, we get asked, um, a lot of it comes down to technology. You know, what, what's best, what's better, what's good, what's great. I, I mean, that's up to the individual. You know, it depends. If you are if you went through your training programs 25 years ago, you're going to be more apt to use a, a, a sling psychrometer and analog equipment. You know, I don't trust the new equipment. It's, you know, yeah. stuff can go wrong. Well, yeah, that's a good point. But, you know, there's a lot more accurate, fast, great ways to record data nowadays. And it's, it's improving. Um, on a day daily basis. I mean, these, you know, the, these major manufacturers of equipment, including us, you know, including Bic, you know, it's not just uh, we have a good product. Let's just rest on our laurels. No, you're always trying to improve the equipment. So I get asked a lot, what's the best method to uh, measure? What's the best method to record? And that basically comes down to your your unique uh, situation. You know, if you're a shop painter that basically, you know, works in pretty good environmental conditions. And all you really care about is taking you know, some profile and DFTs. You may need some, you know, really basic equipment. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're if you're a bridge or tank painter that's, you know, bidding on $25 million projects and, you know, data reporting and, you know, recording is very important. Uh, you got 30 guys on a job or gals on a job then then i would say you you want to step up your game because all the equipment you know there's ways for it to talk to each other you know it makes your project managers uh makes their lives a lot easier um so i i, I think it's uh it's you know there's a lot of different ways to to go about it yep definitely um question here and i'm, I'm we have some uh uh, inside sales and field sales people on the call. I just unlocked your microphone, uh, Mary and Steve. Um, this might be a question for you. Um, uh, asking for color meters. Is there a preferred color index that industries use? Um, C Lab, for example, or are there other in indices? That might be out of your range. 
your skull. Yeah, you got, you got me on that one. That's color. Color. That's, um, a, that's a good question. <laughs> Steve or yes, yes, stump the mat. Yes, you did. Sam. Right. You got we'll, me. We'll take, we'll take care of you, Sam. Uh, Steve <laughs> or Mary, um, if you want to chime in, you can un, uh, mute yourselves. Um, there's a red circle with a microphone in it. You can just click on that and turn green. Um, see if they're paying attention. Um, if not, we will we'll follow up with you, Sam. We, you know, that's another side of our business. We do color, uh, color and appearance um, uh, equipment and, and software as well. So we'll uh, might have to get back with you on that one, sir. Thank you. <laughs> um, what else? Protective coatings. A um, few more minutes left, but uh, if there are yeah, it doesn't seem to be any other questions except Sam's uh, spectrophotometer color meter question, which we will get back with you, sir. Um, I think that'll do it then. Um, you know, thank everybody. Thank you for attending. Um, Matt, thank you for your, your knowledge and expertise. Um, yes, sir. Look, look for a, a longer presentation on this topic um, towards the end of the month. I think it was the 22nd. Um, it's in the chat. Uh, you can copy that uh, HTML link and, and just paste it in your browser and register that. Um, so that's coming up. Uh, we're also looking to do do some more um, on physical code, physical test equipment, uh, protective coatings, things like that. So stay tuned for future invites to um, either this office hours format or a, a full uh, 60 minutes presentation. Um, Again, you'll receive the link of this recording. Uh, feel free to check it out or pass it around the office. Um, if you have any questions at all, hit reply to any of the marketing emails that may come your way, and we'll, we'll route it to uh, Matt and the experts within the organization. Um, with that, thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for attending. Hope you learned something. I definitely did. Prepare your surface. <laughs> That's my takeaway. <laughs> All right. There you go. Thanks, all. Have a great afternoon. All right. Thank all right. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.